Corn School is brought to you by BASF and Pride Seeds. Bernard Tobin here at the Southwest Ag Conference, joined now by uh, Albert Tenuta, omaphropathologist. Sir, thank you so much. Always great to be here at SWAC. Oh, we always enjoy, enjoy having you here. This is our 26th 26. SWAC. As you know, you know, sold out a month in advance. Everybody's having a good time. Learning is the most important thing that we want to bring in and instill in people here. And I think that's uh, been successful again this year. Awesome. Thank you. We're going to learn about some soybean diseases with you, of course, and, oh. uh, and some corn disease. Um, yeah. This year, uh, Don, took up a lot of your time. Um, yeah. It really was a perfect storm. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. We had conditions this year that were from from an environmental standpoint, weather conditions were ideal. So, you know, in normal years, we, we worry or con are concerned about maybe some other factors that can contribute to our gibberella ear rot mm -hmm. and dawn issues such as uh, leaf diseases, northern mm -hmm. corn leaf blight in that, insect feeding, particularly now it's western bean cutworm, used to be European corn borer yep. in that, bird injury in that. But those were minor factors this year. This year, as you said, it's that traditional silk channel infection. Yeah. Classic, traditional. Yeah. And from a pathologist standpoint, it's it's always uh, you know exciting from yeah. from a disease standpoint. Yeah. A couple of things I want to talk about you because you've got some recommendations for 2019. But a, a lot of the conversation, uh, a lot of it starts with hybrids uh, susceptibility. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It looks like you know again there's some susceptible hybrids out oh, there. Yeah. A lot of good ones yeah. and a lot of ones that are not. Yeah, no, and we see that um, on an annual basis in previous years. Like 2006 is another example that was uh, what we would call a high dawn year or epidemic year, and that, and we saw breakdowns of different hybrids. You know, those that would be high dawn producers mm -hmm. and those that would be low dawn producers. So more susceptible, more tolerant, and that. And as we said, with that perfect storm this year, with with the environmental conditions, both temperature wise and more importantly, that moisture. So we think rain often, yeah. right? Now rain is a factor, particularly during those four or five days of silking in that the humidity those dews yeah. you know how we, we go out into that cornfield and it would be noon one o'clock and you'd still be wet you know those are ideal conditions for for the fungi there and so you know the breakdown this year of of um, the disease and the susceptibility that we saw and the and the amount of development this was not the year for instance for us in our inoculation trials yeah. we were getting 80 and 100 parts per million yeah. of, of dawn in that so hybrids play a big factor here yeah. of course and uh, so for next year and and, and, and one of the, the concerns that we have seen or and that are many calls from growers that maybe have shifted their their hybrid use down to maybe one or two hybrids, yeah. whereas before there used to be three or four hybrids. That's an important piece, I think, because as you incorporate more hybrids into your whole farm program, not just the field, but across your acreage there, that reduces your risk as well, yeah. right? And yeah. so some of the the most uh, you're looking for damp. resistance to air rot, right? Yes, absolutely. So you know, yield by far, yield yeah. continues to be the main driver, right? But you know, we have other characteristics that are important, and I would really want growers to to look at those other characteristics. If you don't have them in, say, the um, the, the seed guide or the characteristic guides for those hybrids or so, ask the companies. Yeah. You know, what is the ear rot resistance in that? So get something that has good tolerance or above average tolerance, and that maintains the rest of the factors you need there mm -hmm. as well. And again, as I said, also spread, have more hybrids on there. Again, you're spreading your silking dates, your risk, and everything else. Right. Talk about, uh, I guess, managing Western bean cutworm. You gotta, yeah. you gotta manage, you know, those entry points. Yeah, so, you know, that secondary infection, and that was interesting this year, we also mimicked western bean cutworm injury in some of our inoculated trials where we had um, steel brushes and, and we wounded the, the husk in that and inoculated in there. We didn't see a lot of development from those. It was just more like a quarter type um, lesion there. So it, it didn't develop as much as normally we would see associated with, with those secondary uh, modes of entry in that. And one other aspect we're starting to see now is that maybe the shifting for those insecticide applications. So, you know, the Tracy Bowdies, Art Shasmas, uh, Jocelyn Smiths in, mm -hmm. in, are, are moving those more into that green silk, yep. silking um, um, stage of development, which is perfect if you're going to be looking at a fungicide application or mixing a fungicide insecticide application. And that's another important factor yep. there is, is, you know, using those fungicides as, as a potential for a gibberella era. But it's really, really important also to remember what the fungicides you're going to be using as well as the purpose right. of those, right? Right. Because right. in many cases, uh, if you're targeting that tassel application, you know, that yield enhancement leaf disease, foliar leaf disease one, that's different than gibberella yep. right that's earlier in in the stage of development for the corn plant and that may miss 
be uh, the, the critical stage for, for gibberella infection or, or silk channel infection mm -hmm. as well. Final point to you, um, uh, different type of fungicides. Uh, yeah. A lot of discussion about, you know, uh, the strobies and yeah. whether they're effective and how they should be used and what, what, if anything, we should or could learn from wheat. Well, yeah, no, absolutely. On the on the wheat side of things, in terms of the fungicides and strobilurins, that is one of the, the cautions that we have out there is that uh, not to use those strobilurins, you know, at heading or flowering post post heading in that uh, because of that. Uh, it's been shown and documented to increase dawn levels in that. In corn, there's been a lot of work. We've done some trials, colleagues of ours in the U.S. and, and part of some of these regional projects that we're part of, and we haven't seen that strong association with the strobilurin class as 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 in corn is what we've seen in wheat and again so when it comes to those fungicides and you're targeting um, you know the strobies are targeting more of whether it's strobies DMIs trizols all of those um, combo products that are targeting leaf diseases are different than the gibberellas and there you're looking at, right now we've got corumba and proline would be the two right hey great insights uh, all I know is next year will be different oh every year is different thank you so much thank you so much